So thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate seeing all of you here this morning. And we want to make this really conversational, so please feel free to ask any questions and, you know, if you have a strong urge to come and try them, just jump up and try it as well uh, while we go through. So just to start off with, um, who here dislikes needles? <laughs> okay, thanks for your honesty. And just keep your arm up if you can admit whether you've delayed or avoided getting a blood test or shot before. You've been told, that, yep, okay, so we've got a really honest group here, I like it. Um, so yeah, about 25% uh, of adults um, have avoided or delayed their sort of needles because, uh, or, or healthcare, because they think needles will be involved or they don't go and get their blood test after it's been ordered. So that has a huge implication and 95% of those um, are usually because of a childhood experience that's been quite traumatic when they've had needles as a child. So I have the thankless task of uh, putting needles into children as a paediatrician. So I've done this thousands of times and often we see the child looking very similar to this when we open the door and call them in from the waiting room. So it's not even before, you know, they haven't even gotten to the room and they look pretty upset. And so trying to get them to cooperate and sit still for you to try and kind of aim a needle which is sort of requires millimetre precision into a small vein to get blood is actually very difficult. And so what we find is that we've got simple toys and TV and games um, that we try and entertain them with, but if they look like this, we often have to hold them down or anaesthetise them to get blood. And so we thought we knew there had to be a better way. And so this ha is how Smiley Scope came about. So I started asking children in the waiting room what they'd like to imagine instead. So where would they like to be? Where would they rather be? And a lot of kids said they'd like to be under the sea. And then we would sit down and I'd say, okay, well, let's put on your diving band and let's have waves washing over your arms. And then what do you, you know, tell me what you want to feel the needle to feel like. And so that's when this sort of smiley scope developed was sort of getting a child to talk about what they'd like and reimagine um, for their needle procedure. And we found this incredibly helpful. And so after a, about a year, we decided that this would be great to try and actually make sort of put this into virtual reality. And something really interesting that we found with virtual reality is that um, it's so immersive and so interactive um, that children can virtually escape the procedure room so that you don't need to sort of turn on your imagination when you're really nervous, they're sort of already there and then they can reimagine the experience. And so this is when we approached two bulls and two moose and I'll hand it over. Sure, thanks Evelyn. Um, so two bulls, uh, two moose is actually the children's uh, section of two bulls. Um, we're an engineering company uh, and we started doing a lot of work with kids so we created a brand which Joey leads called Two Moos. And we're very used to working with the constraint of working with children and technology. Uh, but that, in this particular instance, was just the first constraint that Evelyn introduced us to. Um, we heard Evelyn's pitch uh, very similar to what you just heard there and we were immediately fascinated by what she was trying to do. And so we thought, okay, we know children, we know technology. Uh, that's one constraint we're used to working with. Let's add VR to that. Uh, we've done a little bit of work with um, kids and VR. Uh, we knew that it was uh, complicated, especially for younger children. Uh, we knew that there were some issues around it as well, um, some questions about whether it was appropriate for children under, under six or seven. Um, but in this particular instance, because there was such, it was in the service of such a, uh, a great goal, um, we thought it was a great solution. Uh, but um, naturally we needed to um, think about how kids would engage with VR, um, look for a headset that would be appropriate for them, not too heavy, obviously, on those, those little nets, necks and big heads, um, and uh, something, that, um, yeah, something that would be comfortable because that was the entire purpose of the experience. Uh, and the next constraint we had to deal with was the, the medical um, context. Uh, when we think about gaming and, or creating uh, engaging experiences, we often don't think about okay, don't move your arms, don't move your body, don't even move your head too much. Um, that was an enormous constraint when we were trying to, um, when we were thinking about this experience. Uh, 
The, another constraint um, that was related to the medical context, which uh, Evelyn just referred to before we got up here, was that doctors are idiots. Um, <laughs> and particularly when it comes to any kind of device, which is just horrifying when you think about it. But um, um, <laughs> Evelyn has many examples of doctors forgetting to turn them on or accidentally turning them off or turning up the volume too loud. So we need to create an experience that was very, very simple for doctors uh, in the clinical context. Uh, and then the, uh, the final uh, constraint um, that we had was time. <laughs> we had a very, very short time uh, in which to do this. Uh, Evelyn was, was bootstrapping this all together and, um, and driving it uh, with her own passion. Uh, and uh, I think we had clinical trials that we were working towards. Is that right? We certainly had a very hard deadline. So we only had a few weeks uh, to put this together. So we, uh, we went with... Um, uh, objects uh, that we could just grab off the shelf. Um, we put it together in Unity, uh, and it went uh, well. I mean, one of the other things we had to do was um, we had to have plenty of time for testing. Um, not This is before clinical testing, um, just kid testing, just making sure that this experience worked at the most fundamental level. And Joey, do you want to say some stuff? Hello. Uh, I was just going to tell a couple of anecdotes, which was really interesting. Um, so yeah, we built it in Unity, and um, we did a lot of agile, iterative collaboration with Evelyn to get the job done. One of the things that we found um, was for kids, where we have these um, kind of fake arms in the VR experience, and the fish get really close to your arms, so it's as if they're nibbling. Um, when we were testing on adults, the fish were touching that fake arm, and your brain could actually feel tingling sensation. It was awesome. Um, so we were like, this is going to be great for kids. But when we gave it to the kids, they got really scared because these things, they, they, they thought that was their actual arm. So we actually had to pull those objects away. Um, another thing that uh, James touched on was being able to restrict the kids' movement without having to hold them down. So uh, one of our first versions that we tested on kids, we had a lot of assets, a lot of fish, a lot of things happening at their kind of this, this view. Um, but what would happen was that they would get so excited that they would start moving their arms around so we couldn't, you know, give them a needle procedure. So we had to actually angle all the assets down so they would be looking down and that would naturally restrict their arm movements. And then we went too far with that and they ended up just staring at the floor the entire time because we had really <laughs> interesting coral on the floor. Um, so, so just getting through that, um, it, it meant bringing in kids, just our own kids. It, it wasn't a particularly sophisticated group, to be honest. Um, but that was enough, just to get a sense of how children of different ages would engage with VR, um, would engage with um, the particular experience that we'd put together, and how it would match um, at a very high level with what uh, Evelyn was, was after. Uh, and then we went to clinical trials. Do you want to... Yeah, so then after we sort of brought James's kids in, for example, um, we then moved on to doing simulations. So we t brought children in and we said, okay, this is going to be like, imagine you're going to the clinic and getting your blood test done. Um, we're not going to pop a needle in, but, um, and then it was just all about doing all the motions and ensuring that it was timed perfectly to different needle procedures. From there, we did a, a big randomised clinical trial and we were very interested to understand whether you could uh, decrease pain and anxiety um, and also the need to hold children down. Um, so what we did was we recruited two of the largest hospitals in Australia, so the Royal Children's Hospital and Monash Children's Hospital, both in Melbourne. And we looked at uh, kids aged 4 to 11 in two very different settings. So we're interested in the emergency department, so the ER, and the outpatient pathology clinic. So two very different groups. And then we randomised them so that children were either randomised to getting virtual reality or standard care, which was usually TV or toys. We then sort of did baseline tests and, and then afterwards asked them questionnaires asking about their pain, their anxiety, how they found the procedure, whether they had any simulator sickness, so any dizziness, headaches, um, motion sickness. Um, and then we sort of compared those results, which were really interesting. So we found that about uh, the pain for the kids actually went down in the emergency department from their baseline pain. So they reported less pain um, than when they sort of first, before the needle. Um, in 
um, in the um, standard care group, they found an increase in pain as we'd expect. In the pathology group, we found both groups had more pain, but it was significantly less pain in the um, virtual reality group. And we found some, some really interesting examples where that some children got quite upset when the needle actually went in. But we designed the, the experience so that they would go on a dolphin ride after the needle went in. And the dolphin ride is their favourite part. So by the end of it, you know, the proceduralist and everyone said that the pain was fairly high for this child. And then when we asked the child at the end, he was like, no, no pain. That was zero. That was fine. Um, so it sort of is interesting because it's not just reframing pain, but also that memory of pain during the procedure. Another really good story that we found was there was a father who brought his child in and this child had had over 300 blood tests. She was five years old. And um, he was in tears by the end and said to us, you know, that's the very first time that she hasn't cried and I've had to cry for it. He was just so surprised that something that's so simple can make such a difference. Yeah, so um, thinking about those children who um, have to have 300 blood tests um, under five, which is just horrifying, um, we also had to think about how we could create experiences that could be reskinned effectively, um, because you might have children doing this multiple times a week, um, and the effectiveness might wane over time. So while at the moment, as Evelyn mentioned, they're currently riding dolphins, um, they could also be riding rocket ships, uh, riding, what else is there, Joey? Riding horses. dinosaurs, horses, <laughs> um, any number of things. But the experience is always built around the same effective narrative, a sort of introduction, um, and then uh, a period of distraction, which is, I think you can see up there with the fish, um, where the fish are swimming in front of you. And when you point the VR at the fish and you look at them, where, you know, you point your gaze at the fish, um, it'll respond. Uh, and there is the audio, which is an extremely important part of this as well, um, prompts you to look at look for uh, more interesting animals like octopus um, and other animals. Uh, if you find them, um, you get a, a, a payoff just for, uh, just for locking your gaze on them for a certain amount of time. Um, and so all of those things we can relatively easy sw uh, easily swap out uh, and update so it's not uh, gaming or levelling in any traditional sense um, because it's a much more mild experience than that uh, and it's an experience that has ultimately a different goal uh, which is not to trigger any kind of dopamine response but rather uh, distract the children uh, and keep them engaged uh, and in a state of relative sedation for as long as possible. Um, and so, yeah, we also thought about how we could build on the experience uh, th this framework of the experience, um, and then also beyond that, uh, looking at VR in, in different contexts, which again, again, I think Evelyn, you have some um, thoughts. Yeah, so I suppose the next steps for us would be, you know, every time we give it to a child, the adult says, can I please have one too? <laughs> so we'd like to move into sort of adult needles, um, and then there's all sorts of really painful procedures that we do on kids all the time. Um, so they'd be dressings changes, um, stitches, um, you know, removing plaster casts. There's all sorts of things that we can help educate and reframe kids um, through virtual reality. I've got a two and a four year old and I try to feed them every night and uh, this would be an enormous help if I could just <laughs> wear a VR thing and not be there. That would really be fantastic. Um, so I think we also wanted to leave some time for you guys to come up and try them. We've got five headsets um, so we can cycle through people um, if you're interested. Uh, and also some time for, for questions. We've got five minutes left. So if people want to get up, don't be shy. Um, we've got two seats there. You're going to look like an idiot, but that's okay. Don't, don't worry about that. You, you won't be able to see it. Um, <laughs> it is actually really worth doing. It's, it's quite an interesting experience. It's very subtle. Um, but as Joey mentioned before, was that Joey or Evelyn who said, <laughs> it's really weird when the fish start feeding on your arms. You can really feel it. It's a very strange experience. But yeah, Q&A as well. Thanks. Uh, we developed it in Unity. Um, it was a very short time frame. This is uh, the initial prototype and we're um, currently building out on it. Um, so I think we built it all in three to five weeks, really iteratively, really collaboratively with Evelyn and the team. 
Um, we ended up using Unity stock assets um, just in terms of time because for the clinical trials, what we needed to focus on was the structure and the way that the experience itself uh, flowed for the kids and the design was secondary. So uh, the next iteration will have um, like custom design basically and sound effects. So keeping in mind different types of needle experiences and the age of the child, we have, for the prototype, we have three unique experiences, one minute, three minute, and five minute. Um, seven minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs> um, so generally for the younger kids, we like to keep it as short as possible because we don't want them to be using VR for too long. Um, we have extra fun on the seven minute experience. So we've got like the whale just in the seven minute, minute experience. And it would be great if we could remotely trigger um, yeah. different experiences by the doctor. So the doctor could say, okay, I know I'm about to do something particular yeah. and I can trigger it with the remote using yeah. the headset. What's, uh, what's the core technical advantage for the Android device? Uh, the device, the headset itself needs to be sterile. Uh, so you can't use, um, so the Daydream headset has material on it and we wanted to use Daydream because it was the most cost effective and uh, usable for doctors. But um, in order to have it in hospitals, it has to be um, it has to be uh, like a plastic. It has to be customized for the hospital. So we, especially for um, in the future for burn victims, for example, you have to have like not only um, sterilized but also waterproof. And I think Evelyn probably has dozens of more examples. I'll, any I'll take any other questions? This. Yeah, so with our clinical trial, um, essentially we used, uh, we sort of said children from 4 to 11 could use it, and the only criteria that we had to exclude children was they needed to be able to report on our scales. So it was a smiley face scale of 1 to 5, was sort of from a crying face to a happy face, um, and then there was an anxiety thermometer, so from um, completely as cool as a cucumber to really upset and nervous. If they could do that, they were able to participate. Um, and so we did have some children who weren't able to report on those scales. Um, for kids who had um, dis developmental disabilities, probably the one that was most unpredictable was autism. So some children with autism are like really um, have sensory overload and we would just try it first. Um, if they'd been randomised to virtual reality, we would say, why don't you try this first and see how you find it? And we had one or two children who, you know, just it was just so hard to get out of that routine or it was just too much to have something different um, that it didn't work very well. But then we had some children who just found it so interesting and really loved it. So it was quite variable. Um, and then it, it does come down to clinical judgment and understanding each child and what they need. Yeah, so we were surprised that, um, you know, during our clinical trial, we were approached by a lot of people who were interested in, in implementing this and sort of working with us to develop different programs um, and procedures. So we would love to hear from people who have ideas in that space. Um, as clinicians, we, you know, we, we do the clinical thing and we love doing that and, you know, we've got a strong sort of storyline as to how we would approach children. Um, but, yes, on the commercialisation side, um, you know, ultimately we think this is a a tool that can fill a gap from between, you know, the simple toys and holding children down. And so there's a lot of potential in this area. And I think if we can kind of make it accessible, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so with ours, we uh, do distract, um, but it sort of does prepare them, so it does speak them through the different procedures. So, you know, waves are washing over your arms, so there's some cleaning, and, and as we mentioned, the fish nibbling. So there is preparation as well. We do encourage the clinicians to also participate, so it's not just that the child is just watching virtual reality, but it, it's part of a whole entire storyline, so they become part of the experience. And it encourages them to sort of talk more positively and pick up some of the language that we've put into the virtual reality experience. So that we've found clinicians have stopped saying, you know, we're just going to be, you know, it's a sharp 
poke or a scratch. They're st stopping using that language and they're using fish nibbling so that the child can reframe that because they may not feel pain. Often we put in, like we have a local anaesthetic cream so children don't feel pain so they can reimagine that. Thank you very much. Um, please feel free to come up and talk to us after. We'll probably be in the foyer, so thank you.